Well, God is a God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some, then welcome to this, a study of the life and the book of Joshua. God gave Joshua the most famous mulligan in the history of humanity, a second chance to enter the promised land, and Joshua and his people didn't have to be asked twice. And if you're in need of a second chance and curious about promised land living, then the book of Joshua is for you. Let's make our Glory Days declaration. This will be our final time to do it as a congregation since we're wrapping the series up today. So please put your shoulders back, hold your head up, fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope, and say it like you mean it. You ready? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. Indeed, they are, Father. Grant that we can understand who we are, how you have taken up residence within us how the very presence of Christ is in our hearts. May we just be who you've called us to be. Grant, O Father, that you forgive the sins of the speaker. They are many. And help us to see Jesus and just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Well, today we bring to an end our study through the book of Joshua. I think you'd probably agree with me that 17 weeks is too short to get through this beautiful, power-packed book before we review what I think is the big takeaway message of the book of Joshua. Can I just say again what an honor it is to preach at the Oak Hills Church? I've often said that if God ever forced me to choose between breathing and preaching, I'm confident that I would suffocate. No greater delight in my life than to preach here and then preach all over the world, to travel at different congregations and events. And the highlight is preaching right here at my home congregation. We did a little tally and figured up that this is, this is the, isn't that good? We, this is my 60th series at this church, 60th series. That's a lot, isn't it? Uh, And some of you have have put up with a lot of dull preaching through the years, and I appreciate it. I started when I was three. That's why I look so young (laughs) on this. And I can't think of a better way to strengthen our faith than to consider the story of Joshua. Here's the context in case you don't know or have forgotten. The story of Joshua involves seven years of unbridled success in the history of the nation of Israel. Anyone who's looked at the Bible knows that the Bible doesn't pretend that the chosen people of God, the Hebrews, were perfect people. You're not far into the book and you see Abraham had too many wives and Esau told too many lies. Uh, Joseph's brother uh, brothers sold him into slavery, and that ended up in years of slavery in Egypt. I mean, it just seems like it was one mess after another. They built two temples only to lose them. They were given the Ark of the Covenant for crying out loud, and nobody knows where that is. Problems after problems, difficulties after difficulties. Other nations in the ancient world were flexing their muscles. Greece was expanding her empire. Babylonia was building her cities. But the Hebrews just kept dropping the cheese off their crackers and ended up as a remote people, oppressed and struggling, except for these seven years. During these seven years, they put the enemies on their heels During these seven years that began somewhere around 1400 B.C., Moses had died, Joshua took over the leadership, God spoke, Joshua listened, and the glory days began. The Jordan River opened, the spies went in, Rahab was discovered, God came and appeared to the children of Israel. 
Joshua was encouraged. Jericho was encircled. The people of Ai attacked. Achan sinned, but the people of Israel stood back up on their feet. Shechem was memorialized. The sun stood still. It's just one victory after another until the land was distributed among the Hebrew people. And they inhabited the promised land. And they went from hapless wanderers to hope-filled homesteaders. And they began to build farms. And they began to develop vineyards. And they quarried a life out of those Canaanite hills. So resounding was their success that the narrator, the historian of the book of Joshua, likely Joshua himself, wrote this one paragraph that summarized their conquest. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. What sweeping statements. The Lord gave all the land. The Lord gave them rest. Not a man of all their enemies stood against them. All came to pass. And what seems like one moment to the next, they come out of the wilderness into the promised land and they go from winter chill to springtime thaw and a new season begins. I'm wondering if you could use a new season in your life. I'm wondering if you're ready to enter into a time in which one victory follows another in which struggles exist for sure, but struggles don't rule the day, in which your past is really past, in which your future is really bright, in which you really believe that God's Word is true and His promises are sure. I'm wondering if you're ready to come out of the wilderness and enter the promised land. The nation of Israel, if you remember, is marked by three geographical locations, really four if you toss in Babylonian detention later in their history, but especially those three, Egypt, the wilderness, and the promised land. In Egypt, they were enslaved by the Egyptians. In the wilderness, they were free from the Egyptians, but still enslaved to their fear. It is when they crossed the Jordan that they came both out of the wilderness and out of their fear, and they began to walk in faith. Those three locations exist today. Egypt represents our lives before Christ when we were in bondage to our own guilt, enslaved to death. Because our deliverer came and led us through the Red Sea of salvation, we too were released. Many Christians, however, get stuck right there. They have just enough deliverance to deliver them from Egypt, but they don't have enough faith to step into the promised land. They mirror the decision of the people of Moses. Remember, the children of Moses could have begun their glory days 40 years earlier But when they had a chance to step over the promised land through the Jordan by faith, they said, oh, the giants are too big, the demands are too many. And they settled for a second-rate, meandering, Bedouin life in the wilderness. According to many surveys, many Christians do the same. I began this study by telling you about a particular Gallup survey recorded in the book, The Saints Among Us. It came out in the mid-1990s in which it announced that only 13% of Christians would call their Christian life a victorious Christian life. Only 13% would say, I'm overcoming temptation. Only 13% would say, I'm pressing forward. I have more joy today than I had yesterday. I'm strong in the grace That means nearly 9 out of 10 believers would say, well, I think I'm in the wilderness. 
A more recent study that I came across since I shared with you the Gallup study mirrors that number. It's put out by Reveal Research, the Reveal Research team, of which our own minister, Greg Hawkins, has been an active participant and leader. That took the number 13% down to 11%. So nearly 9 out of 10 Christians are not quite hitting on all cylinders. They're feeling like there's a disconnect between what God promised and what they are experiencing. I think the book of Joshua is in the Bible to help us come out of the wilderness and into the promised land life that God has promised. How can we see our Jerichos come down? How can we see our enemies be driven out? How can we respond in faith? The book of Joshua is in the Bible to help us answer that question. So what was the difference? What was the difference between the generation of Moses and the generation of Joshua? What was the difference between those who spent the 40 years in the wilderness and those who did more in seven years than their ancestors did in the prior 40? Well, the answer comes down to one word, and that is inheritance. Inheritance. The theme of Joshua is inheritance. Verse 6 of chapter 1, God says these words to Joshua, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers. Inheritance is to Joshua what barbecue is to Texas. (laughs) Everywhere, on every corner, fragrant, and mouth-watering. Fifty-one times the word inheritance appears in the book of Joshua. At least ten times the command from God, possess the land, is given. Inheritance. The children of Israel believed that they had inherited the land from God. In fact, the victory of the book of Joshua is found in chapter 24 and verse 28. So Joshua let the people depart, each to their own inheritance. The big message of Joshua is not that the people conquered the land and received it, but that the people received the land that God had conquered and inhabited it. Did that make sense? The big message is not that they conquered the land and then received it. We pointed out the absence of references to any military tactics. We really don't know what they did, what weapons they used, because the battle was not theirs. The battle was God's. They received their inheritance. So the big difference between Joshua's generation and Moses' generation, between the people of the promise and the people of the wilderness, was simply this. They believed their inheritance. The big difference between Christians of victory and Christians of apathy is the victorious Christian dares to believe their inheritance. They really believe that God has gifted to them the inheritance of God Himself into their lives. Our inheritance is not real estate on a part of the planet. Our inheritance is a real state of mind and fact of faith. Our inheritance is not a piece of property. It is the peace of God in Himself. Our inheritance is not land. It is God, God Himself. So the big question when we study and read the book of Joshua and how they receive their inheritance is this question for you and me, and that is, are you living out of your inheritance? Are you living out of your inheritance? Did you know that the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? 
God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He has blessed you. Not He will bless you, or He bless some Christians and not others, or He might bless you if you do the right thing, or if you come up with a secret code. This is past tense. It's a fait accompli. It has already happened. God has blessed you. The pantry is open. Your name has been written on the courthouse registry. The inheritance has been announced. The will has been, what do we do with the will? Ratify it? Satisfy it? Probate it? It's been accomplished. It's done. It's already in your name. God has already given you everything for you to be everything he wants you to be. I don't say many wise things. I may have just said one, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> God has already given you everything to be everything that He wants you to be. Isn't that the promise of Ephesians 1.3? He's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I think this very well may be the best-kept secret in Christendom. And that is simply, we don't know, we don't fully appreciate what happened to us when we came to Christ? Uh, many people, if you were to ask them, what happened when you became a Christian? They would speak the language of forgiveness. And well, they should. For all of our sins were washed away. Everyone, not just the past, but the future. All of our sins were washed away. We were saved by the grace of Christ. But God not only dealt with our sins, but he dealt with our interior, with our desires, with our ability, with our skills. He gave us a whole new sense of himself. Here it is. When you gave your heart to Christ, he returned the favor, and he gave his heart to you. This is your inheritance, the very being of Christ within you. When you walk into a room, Christ walks into that room. When you say hello to your family, your family is seeing a version of Christ, an expression of Christ. This means that you and I have access to everything which Christ has access to. You need more forgiveness? Christ has plenty. Need more peace? Christ has some. Can't forgive your neighbor? Well, that's okay. Christ can, and he lives inside you. Can't resist temptation of internet pornography or the bottle? Well, it's difficult, but Christ can do it. And since he lives in you, it's not up to you. The big message of Joshua, indeed the big message of the Bible, is not that you fight for God, but that God fights for you. And that he takes up residence within you. Here's what I think we miss. I, I agree with a writer named Dwight Edwards. He says this. Many Christians view their conversion as something like a car wash. You go in a filthy clunker. You come out with your sins washed away. You're a cleansed clunker. <laughs> conversion is a cleansing. Absolutely. Absolutely. But conversion is more than a removal of sin. It is a deposit of power. When you are converted, when you give your heart to Christ, when you cross the Red Sea and are delivered out of your own Egyptian captivity, he not only cleanses you, if we can stick with that metaphor, in the car wash. While you're in the car wash, he, lifts, he pops the hood and he pulls out that old engine, that two-cylinder, high-mileage, old 1963 Rambler engine, cracked cylinders and broken carburetor. He pulls it out, and while you're passing through, he deposits within you a brand-new humming Ferrari engine, and he bolts it down, and he slams the hood, and he empowers you, so much so that some of those who have really tapped into the power of this indwelling presence of Christ said things like this, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives where? 
in me. The Apostle Paul said that. The Apostle Paul also said this in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. And all things have become new. Boy, that's good news, isn't it? This means maybe you don't have enough patience, but Christ does, and he lives in you. You may not have enough self-control, but Christ does, and he lives in you. All that we need to do is learn to press the gas pedal and access this power. 2 Peter 1.3, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And he will equip you with everything you need for doing his will. There are many messages in the book of Joshua, but I think the big message is believe your inheritance. Possess your possessions. Inherit the inherit. You're not only an heir, but the scripture says you are a co-heir with Christ. The old mindset, the wilderness mindset says, well, I have to conquer the land if I want to have it. The promised land mindset says, God conquered the land, now I'm going to enter it. And the old outlook says, well, I'm going to have to earn God's blessings if I'm going to have any. The new mindset says, I have complete access to all of God's blessings, and I'm going to live in them. The old mindset says, well, I'm just a slave. I'm just a meanderer. I've made bad decisions. The new mindset says, well, I made some bad decisions, but God loved me enough to pluck me up and to plop me right here in his promised land, and I'm going to live like a victor. The old mindset says, well, I'm a victim. I've been beaten down. We made the wrong choice. The new mindset says, I'm a victor because God does not fail, and God lives inside me. The old mindset says, my struggles are going to win. The new mindset says, well, there are struggles for sure, but God is going to win. The old mindset says, I guess I'm going to spend all of my life walking in circles out here in the wilderness. The new mindset says, watch out, Jericho. Watch out, Jordan River. Watch out, Amalekites and Canaanites. Watch out, you enemies, because I'm coming in in the power and in the name of of Christ. The old mindset says, I was born into a family of losers. I guess I'm going to be a family of losers. The new mindset says, I don't care what I was born into. I've been born again into the family of God, and now I can reverse the trajectory of my ancestry, and my children will not inherit what I inherited. The old mindset says that I have bad habits that I can't break. The new mindset says, yeah, I've got some bad habits, but boy, just give me some time. Give me some prayer. Give me some faith. I'm going to press forward in faith, and we know that every day is a new victory. So are you inheriting your inheritance? The promise that God gave Joshua is the promise he gives to you. God said, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given. Not I will give, but I have given to you. In other words, the only thing that stands between you and your promised land is a walk of faith. Everywhere you go in faith, you're going to find victory. Now, folks, we live in a world that knows so much defeat, It talks about defeat, that builds news programs around defeat. Everything is defeat, defeat, defeat. And maybe all your life you felt like it's just one defeat after another. Listen, you were made for more than that. Your destiny is not defeat. It's a battle, it is. It's a fight, it is. It's not always easy, but there is this promise that God will walk with you. I want to close with what I told you at the outset was my favorite image out of the book of Joshua. It comes out of Joshua's, what seems to be his final speech to his men. And remember, there were at least 30,000 soldiers, 2 million immigrants. So, I mean, it's a large gathering And I picture Moses standing up there. He's well over 80 years old now. 
battle-worn, grizzly beard, hair down to his shoulders. But boy, he's got faith and fire in his eyes. And he stands up in front of that vast gathering. And among what he says are these words. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord is your God. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. I love that image. One of you shall chase a thousand. One of you, I can see a thousand of the enemy, the Canaanites and the Hittites. I can see a thousand of them coming over a hill. And they look down and there's one Hebrew all by himself. And he pulls out his sword and all 1,000 of them turn and run because at the end of this campaign, they know that God is with him. I'm seeing the evil ones come in your direction, your enemies of fear or guilt or insecurity or sin or hurt. But I'm seeing you rise up like the person of God you are, the child of God you are, and you're going to pull out of your scaffold, scabbard, scab, what do you call it? Where would we keep a sword? You're going to pull it out, and you're going to hold it up high. God's Word, your sword, and all of those evil forces are going to turn and run because they cannot go where God is. You're going to press forward in faith, you're going to inherit your land. You're going to stand strong on God's promises. Would you do this? Would you dare to believe that the God who is in you is greater than any enemy who comes against you? Would you dare to take all of the I can'ts out of your vocabulary and begin saying, but with God I can. With God I can. Would you dare to believe that God himself is fighting for you? This is the message of Joshua. Not your fight for God, but God's fight for you. Believe the presence of the almighty God is within you. And when you look into the mirror, you may not think the person who looks back is that good looking. You may think he's getting old, losing his hair, getting whatever. But what matters is what's within you. That is the wisdom of God, the love of God, the power of God, the presence of God. And we need you. Our city needs you. Your family needs you. Your ancestry needs you. Your children need you. We need you to cross out of the wilderness into the promised land and begin living from victory unto victory. Because these days really are glory days. They really are. And with God as your helper, you will do all God wants you to do and you'll be all God wants you to be and you'll receive everything that God wants you to receive. Your past is past. It's gone. You're a brand new person. Your future is bright. You cannot imagine all the wonders that God has prepared for you. God is here. And he is here to walk you into this next version of yourself. It's time to move out of the past and into the future with God as your helper. His word is sure. His promises are true. These days are glory days. Amen. All right, Lord, please help us to receive this. Please let it go deep within us. Let us be different people. Some of us have stalled out. We're just kind of stuck, and we're walking in circles. Uh, we're living like we were living a few years ago. We're, 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 we've not made any progress. But, Lord, today we're ready. We're ready to move forward. We're ready to be the people you want us to be. Lord, thank you. Thank you that, that what matters is more your hold on us than our hold on you, and that you never give up on us, though we often give up on you, and that you never turn away, even though we have done just that. Lord, please today hear our prayers as we come ready for a new season. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen.